Nations in Ghana. I mean, the minister should come and tell us something. No? In a very busy day in Parliament uh, today, as the NDC MP uh, Rashid Pelpo is now demanding that Ghana's uh, government call for a ceasefire in Israel's war uh, against Gaza. But in spite of the concerns by the minority side of the House, government is unwilling to change its posture on the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. I'm going back to Israel and Palestine. Right. Ghana uh, on that issue has not changed. And we'll bring you that exclusive interview with uh, Ambassador at Large, Kobinao Sayedanko, who talks to us uh, here on the polls uh, and also later this weekend on Foreign Affairs. Uh, but later in the bulletin, the Ashanti Regional Security Council is warning against the deployment of a heavily uh, built uh, group of armed men and any other private security group to. Uh, the various polling stations for Saturday's presidential primaries of the governing New Patriotic Party were live in the region for the latest as the NPP prepares uh, for its internal elections. We have these and more coming away here on The Pulse. The Pulse is always brought to you by Global Communities, Digni, Lu, Affordable, Safe Sanitation. We're on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 125, on Facebook, YouTube and at MyJoyOnline.com. I'm Lesa Sogan. Welcome to The Pulse. We'll bring you details shortly. Please stay. Well, uh, this afternoon there's been a bipartisan call directed at the uh, Kolebu Teaching Hospital to immediately reopen the outpatients department uh, and its renal unit. Outpatients since May 2022, uh, and that's been forcing patients to seek a dialysis service elsewhere. The Renal Patients Association has uh, said dozens of their members are suffering kidney diseases. Uh, have died due to this uh, very closure, delivering a statement uh, on the floor of Parliament. Ranking member on the Health uh, Committee described the hospital's closure of the facility as unconscionable. Parliament as a whole should be deeply concerned about the persistent closure of the renal unit outpatient department at Kolebu Tijen Hospital. This situation has far-reaching implications for the well-being of dialysis patients in Ghana and raises serious questions about the commitment of government to transparency and accountability in our healthcare institutions. In the initial case of the facilities closure was attributed to scarcity of essential medical consumables required for dialysis. When dialysis medical consumables were finally procured, the service saw an unprecedented increase in fees. When dialysis medical consumables were finally procured, the service saw an unprecedented increase in fees. We just consolidate everything and put it in the export trade house for onward distribution to the East African bloc. And it's doing quite well. Hopefully, we will be able to expand to other countries. And what country are we looking at the next few years? By the end of the year. Two or three countries? About two or three. After, there are some who are worried that Ghana has the headquarters. Maybe if I'm wrong with the comparison, uh, we might end up having the headquarters and the real benefits that comes along with it might not be realized. And the hospital administration must, a mat as a matter of priority, address this situation. The denial of essential health care services is a severe violation of patients to rectify this and how government must move into act. And so back to your question, yes. The majority chief whip, Frank Anadam Press, spoke on behalf of his colleagues and said that it is true that this dialysis crisis is something that is really hampering the efforts of so many people who have kidney diseases to be able to access quality health care. And they joined calls to the Kolebu Teaching Hospital to immediately open that outpatient department of the ren renal unit. And what we understand now is that they are also asking that the Speaker of Parliament directs the Health Minister to come to the floor. You can listen to another on prayer, passionately um, uh, back the, 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 the assertions or the, the statement of, Frank, uh, of um, the NDC on the floor today. Right. Myself with a call for the Minister to be programmed to appear. That is something we cannot compromise on. He must appear. 
and especially in a matter about the lives of our citizenry, we can't take for granted. It can happen to any of us. And so I'm fully associated with that call. It's about the lives of our people. Whatever it takes, he must appear. We must program him to appear and to brief us. Immediately, the Kolebu Rena unit should be open immediately. And there are some other actions that have been taken. That is why I'm emphasizing the call. As we, go, we need you to bless this call that the minister should be programmed to come and make this statement formally on the floor of parliament. He can't sit in his ministry and engage the media and make this statement. He must come to the representative of the people and make this statement formally in the house. Uh, quite an unusual uh, posture there uh, by the majority uh, whip. Uh, the, the point about you know, his, his reason for which he cannot understand why the health minister is unwilling to appear before the House. Uh, what, what, what else do we know about you know, the backstory to this and why we're seeing this kind of a bipartisan support? And, and what's been the speaker's directive on the matter? Well, blessed. so both sides really believe that the dialysis crisis is a big matter that government and everyone must pay attention to. What they are saying, and you heard there, Frank, and the majority mm. chief with Kokwenti Mamenu is a member of parliament on the MPP side. That is his chief web on the floor saying that the minister cannot be in his office issuing statements and speaking to the media. He must come to the floor of parliament. He must come to the people's representatives and speak to them as to the state of play in terms of what is going on, what the dialysis treatment and the kidney diseases and the, the suffering of so many patients across the country. And so that is quite a rare bipartisan support that we saw there from a leader on the opposite side. But at the end of the day, a lot more MPs spoke, but the Speaker of Parliament agreed with the assertion and the, this demand by the minority, as well as the majority leadership, that the health minister must come before the House, brief MPs not only on the closure right. of this renal unit OPD, but must ensure that there are astounding issues having to do with dialysis treatment, among other things. In the- Why choose a Sleep Number smart bed? Because only the Sleep Number Climate 360 smart bed lets you each sleep up to 13 degrees cooler or warmer on either side. While you both sleep at your ideal level of firmness, comfort, and support, your Sleep Number setting. And now our all-new next-gen smart beds have temperature benefits, so you sleep better night after night. And now the new Queen Sleep Number C2 smart bed is only $8.99. Ends Monday. To learn more, go to sleepnumber.com. Andrew Amakwe issuing that directive on the floor a while ago. To come and brief us. Yes. We come to aggregators and even vendors. Mm. Currently, 5.5 programs in Ghana. I mean, the minister should come and tell us something. Almost everywhere, people are talking about the kidney related programs. He should come and tell us if. Us, uh, joining us live from the hospital facility, which is at the center of this whole controversy. Maxwell, I see that uh, right in front of the facility. Do we know if the OPD has been opened now to patients? Uh, well, blessed. Um, at a stance now, the outpatients um, department of the um, the phrology unit um, has not been opened to the outpatients. Um, I'm talking about the dialysis unit of the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. It has not been opened yet um, to outpatients. Um, we've been speaking to our sources here um, at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, and um, they tell us that uh, some modalities would have to be put in place um, before the rollout of this directive, and they're looking at doing that immediately. Um, I can confirm to you that as we're speaking right now, um, the communications, um, the public relations unit of this hospital is drafting a statement. That statement should be released in less than an hour, and it should basically communicate um, to the outpatients who had earlier raised concerns about the closure of the um, facility to them um, that now they can come to the hospital and assess the OPD um, services. So that statement, we should be expecting that statement in less than um, an hour. 
But some other issues um, are also coming up as we speak to you right now. There's no clarity whatsoever on whether or not the death situation that forced the closure um, of the facility to outpatient has been settled. We don't have clarity on that matter here. Um, but the, my source here at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital who has been speaking to also cannot confirm to us whether the facility has received that four million Ghana cities, that debt that compelled it to um, close the OPD to the um, outpatients. Remember that during the Joy News Talk Leadership um, event on this matter, the CEO for the um, facility, Dr. Mpuma, um, mentioned that even if the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, even if the four million Ghana city debt is settled, the hospital will still need monthly close to 1 million Ghana cities, a subsidy of 1 million Ghana cities to enable it continue with its operations. In fact, he told us that if that 1 million, close to 1 million Ghana cities, that's the 961,000 Ghana cities, is not provided a monthly to support um, the um, services here, the renal units, the dialysis units, um, I should say, would shut down. Now, um, some days ago when I spoke to my source here, the source told me that if the hospital is forced to open up its um, services to the outpatients with the consumables that they have um, currently, it would just last one month. If it lasts one month, then they would have to close the dialysis, the renal dialysis units, you know, um, entirely. So all of these questions are begging um, for answers and we've been trying to get clarity um, on the matter because the directive came just a little over uh, three hours ago we do not have much information from the authorities we've been here um, for some time and we've been trying to get you know um, some answers we are told that some discussions would have to go on but all of that would take place before uh, you know, the day ends so as it stands right now the statement is being drafted and that will be officially communicated to the outpatients of the um, renal dialysis unit of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, communicated to them that now they can access OPD services here at the um, Kolebu Teaching Hospital. And like I mentioned earlier, we should get that statement in less than um, an hour here. Bless it. Uh, Maxwell Agwagba giving us the very latest uh, from the Kolobu Teaching Hospital, as you see in your shots there, the outpatients department. Uh, for those going in for renal services, completely shut down. It's the reason for which in Parliament uh, we're seeing that directive uh, come through for the sector minister, Kwekwa uh, Jiman to appear before uh, the House and to brief MPs uh, on what may be accounting for this crisis and the issue about the debt of 4 million Ghana cities, uh, which... Uh, Urgently, the health facility needs to clear off uh, and to reopen uh, the centre. Uh, Maxwell will be stationed there and will definitely uh, bring you some updates uh, in an hour or two from now. Uh, stay on the Join News channel as we uh, pursue that matter to a conclusive end. Uh, we take you back to Parliament uh, because uh, in the House today, the NDC MP for WA Central, Dr. Abdul Rashid uh, Pelpo, is uh, asking the government of Ghana to immediately demand a ceasefire in the ongoing war in Gaza, Israel's uh, uh, war. Uh, and as we know it, they've declared that uh, sledge on Gaza with a daily bombardment of the uh, occupied Palestinian uh, territory. Uh, this follows the widely condemned Hamas attack on Israel that claimed the lives of more than 1,300 Israeli citizens. Since Israel declared war on Gaza, at least 9,000 persons have been killed, many of whom are children. Uh, more from Dr. Palpal shortly, but listen first uh, to the statement from the Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister, uh, Mavis in Kansabwedu, denouncing the actions of Hamas and explaining no Ghanaian has been caught in the conflict. A press release on the 8th October 2023, the government of Ghana unreservedly expressed its condemnation of Hamas' attack and actions and retreated Israel's right to exist and defend itself. The statement further called on Hamas to withdraw its militants from southern Israel and urged the government of Israel to also exercise restraints in its response to Hamas' attack. The African Union, on its part, issued a communique in which the chairperson called on both parties to put an end 
to the hostilities and return to the negotiation table to implement the principle of the two-state solution. Mr. Speaker, let me conclude by indicating that although the disastrous nature of the conflict has raised so many concerns about the welfare of Ghanaians in Israel, our mission in Tel Aviv has reported that no Ghanaian has been caught up in the attacks and the Ghanaian community is safe. As of now, the issue of evacuation of our nationals from Israel has not been raised. In addition, our mission is in close contact with the leaders of the Ghanaian community and is providing the ministry with the updates on their welfare. And we provide the, the general public with updates pertaining to the welfare of Ghanaians in Israel. Uh, well, we can now hear from uh, Dr. Rashid Felpo, who uh, says Israel has killed enough Palestinians in Ghana as a member of the United Nations Security Council must demand an immediate ceasefire. Today, the Palestinians are locked up. They can't even leave the country. Bombs are flying every day, up and down. Children are dying. Everybody, you sleep, you don't know whether you wake up or not. Mr. Speaker, for us in this parliament, the one thing we have to ask for is for a ceasefire, immediate ceasefire. Not for any other thing at all, not for an even humanitarian ceasefire. We are asking for a ceasefire, we are asking for negotiation. If it is about retaliatory measures, Israel has killed about 8,500 8, Palestinians. If the Palestinians realize that what they did has come to a point when they have to begin to reflect they may have reflected upon it now that they didn't have the right to go into other country, another can person's country to cause the harm they caused. They may have reflected upon it now that they didn't have the right to go into other country, another can person's country to cause the harm they caused. What he has criticized Parliament for relaxing the Fiscal Responsibility Act to allow government. have wish the government not to dilly dally with the situation to be saying Palestinians stop, these people stop work. Just call for ceasefire. So that you see that government of Ghana is calling for ceases. The and Kweku Asante is back with us. Uh, Kweku, uh, we know that there's uh, also in this matter a bipartisan condemnation of Israel's uh, action in Gaza, uh, despite uh, you know the issues surrounding uh, Israel's rights uh, to defend its territory. First, what's been um, you know the reaction from uh, the Parliamentary Committee on Foreign Affairs? We know that Samuel Kujetu Blako has been commenting on this matter as well. And kindly unmute for me, Kweku, so I can hear you. Uh, if you could just do that for me briefly. Well, my apologies, Blessed. It's been a day of rare show of bipartisanship on the floor. A lot of the things that have come up today, both sides have really agreed that this is something that we, we, we have to do. We hearing from Samuel Atachina, who's the MP for Ebuako South. Mm. He says that Israel must not allow itself to be consumed by rage. And in terms of its response so far, he believes that it has not been proportionate if a mass killed 1,400 people, condemnable issue. You've killed 9,000 people and you are still dropping bombs on refugee camps and, and other such um, civilian health places. He believes that must end and Israel must be told you cannot continue breaching international law. Do not let rage overcome you. That's what President Joe Biden said. And that is what I believe the international community should sound strong to Israel because if you look at the disproportionate level of the violence it leads might to be desired I do not believe that in trying to find uh, Hamas to wipe them out it should live in this trail the death of innocent people who never visited violence on Israel and I pray to God that Israel should see this. You do not destroy the innocent in the hope that you find uh, uh, the mercenaries or those who did the violence. And that understanding should dawn on Israel. And I think it is the position of even America that we should look at it from that perspective and contain the situation. More MPs are joining this, uh, including Sylvester Tete. Appears to be the one who even uses some more strong words. He believes that some of Israel's action 
may amount to war crimes. And he believes that the ceasefire must come in immediately and Israel must end the bombardment of the Gaza Strip. War, we have to protect and defend the vulnerable wherever you find them. These are civilians, medical professionals, and even people who no longer have the strength to fight. Mr. Speaker, the position of this country must be supported in all our deliberations that the Israeli people must give way for it to be given to those caught up in this war. Those that are caught up in Gaza Strip, Mr. Speaker, they cannot all be described to be people belonging to the Hamas group or the Palestinians as it were. That is why it is important that we call for unlimited access of aid to the Gaza Strip to ensure that international conventions on rights of persons where wars are being declared are respected in that uh, respect. Mr. Speaker, we have a responsibility and obligation to protect civilians in times of war. This becomes a war crime and the Israeli government show help to respect that. Whilst we ask that they respect the rights of every citizen or the vulnerable in times of war, we also call on Hamas to cease fire. Even the supply of medical aid, water, fuel, and other essentials into Gaza has been uh, restricted, especially in or the vulnerable in times of war. We also call on Hamas to cease fire. Even the supply of medical aid, water, fuel, and other essentials into Gaza has been uh, restricted, especially by um, virtue of the fight going on within the area. The lives of virtue of the fight going on within the area. The lives of Devin, you to enjoy the rest of our programs. Bye. Hello everyone, it's Friday. Welcome to the Marketplace. Coming up in this edition, Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of Ghana concludes its 114th meeting today ahead of its announcement of a new policy rate on Monday, September 25. We will be analyzing what the outcome will be and its impact on businesses. Economy was uh, targeted and bombarded, Mr. Speaker. Those are some of the things that we ought to speak against and ensure that the rules of war. I understand some MPs are really concerned that President Kufari took to the podium in the United States declaring support for Israel when Ghana has always been a non aligned country. And these are some of the concerns that MPs have shared. They, they've shared on this matter. Very bipartisan show of support, almost all MPs who spoke, most of them condemning the Hamas attack in Israel, but also condemning Israel for its high handedness and its attack on okay. innocent civilian lives in the Gaza Strip. But they have failed to pass a resolution, which means government will just have to listen to them as an advice. If they wish to take that, they will. If they do not wish to take that, they will take some other course of action. Mm. Uh, Koku Asante, parliamentary correspondent, joining us with the latest on this. Uh, also uh, joining this conversation is international relations expert uh, with the Afro Global Research Center, uh, Dr. Ishmael uh, Hlombo is joining us there via Zoom now. Thank you, sir, for spending some time with us. Um, you know, parliament can do its bit, but of course, uh, per the you know, requirements of the Constitution, our dealings with other nations would largely be driven by the President's posture and approach on this matter. Uh, what do we go from here, looking at what Parliament has is, is been trying to send to government? Thank you, and good afternoon to your viewers. Uh, I think it is welcoming that at the end, Parliament is beginning to uh, make uh, some uh, uh, I think it is welcoming that at the end, Parliament is beginning to uh, make uh, some. Uh, that from you know treasury rate that is going up, the way it shows mm. you know how desperate uh, Israel uh, means that we have virtually mortgaged ourselves uh, 
uh, in the way that will not help us to be uh, mediators in, in this conflict. And as we then appoint to reassess our position, if we look at the Southern American countries who have been quite How desperate uh, Israel, it uh, means that we have virtually mortgaged ourselves uh, uh, in the way that will not help us to be uh, mediators in, in this conflict. And as we then appoint to reassess our position, if we look at the Southern American countries who have been quite independent in, in terms of how they view this issue, some of them, Bolivia, for instance, have severe ties with, with Israel as a protest against what is going on. Uh, we cannot say because of, we totally support Syria, for instance, have severe ties with, with Israel as a protest against what is going on. Uh, we cannot say because of, we totally support Syria. Right. We are expecting government to, you know, say the one employing, right? Because we are expecting that government to lay the foundation. Mm. Business picks up, it up from there and then... The businesses will expand, and from there going, they will work. Mm. start employing people. Mm. But that's not what we see. Mm. We see government directly, you know, doing... In terms of uh, disregard for international law. So I think that uh, uh, this call by the parliamentary, which is quite bipartisan, which is quite... And, and from there going, they will work. Mm. start employing people. Mm. But that's not what we see. Mm. We see government directly, you know, doing... In terms of uh, disregard for international law. So I think that... Uh, uh, this call by the parliamentarian, which is quite bipartisan, which is quite interesting because of, of the nature of our own politics. So I guess uh, uh, this call by the parliamentarian, which is quite bipartisan, which is quite interesting because of, of the nature of our own politics. So I guess... Mm. expenditure, not on business. So, uh, so if we look at the GDP numbers for you, we shouldn't be so much excited we, about these numbers shouldn't. because shouldn't. in terms of the recovery, we are still nowhere near recovery. Shouldn't. You know, we've, 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 we've had... GDP growth of about 6.1 before. Yeah. That was latter part of, you know, um, 2021. Yeah. And what did we see? Mm. And I always term it as an economy that is hanging. While manufacturing firms are highlighting the challenging state of industries, despite claims that the economy is showing signs of recovery, they argue that sales are declining while some are looking at moving into import and packaging. Chief Executive of the Association of Ghana Industries, Seth Chumakwabwa, who disclosed this to Joy Business, noted that the situation calls for some intervention to save the situation. And I've been visiting a lot of companies lately as well to assess the situation. And generally speaking, the general mood is that uh, industries are struggling, sales are down, they are not meeting targets. And I'm not surprised that the data that was released clearly showed uh, a bit of contraction in the industrial sector, especially manufacturing and construction and other, other areas. So clearly, uh, industry is struggling. And, and, and surprisingly, it's not just the items that one could consider uh, luxury goods. Even the essential commodities, basic items that are consumable products that we consume on a daily basis, you know, when you talk to companies producing these items, their sales have dropped compared to the year before and perhaps a couple of years back. So clearly, uh, there's a struggle in the system, and it's clearly determined by the fact that consumer spending has gone. Don't reject a resolution because it's coming from a particular actor that you think that you, you, you don't support. So I believe that, yes, uh, we should. Uh, this is the only way we can demonstrate we can the, 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 the kind of action Israel is taking mm. uh, because, particularly in relation to. Uh, uh, civilian casualties in relation to uh, bombing of places that uh, naturally within war, uh, those are considered safe havens for people to run to. Uh, so yes, um, uh, I think Parliament is, is is in the right, is taking the right steps. They should continue in that light. But uh, I think that maybe the next time a resolution will help us to give a clearer direction of what we want the 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 the, 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 the government to do. Yeah, but the question is, what do we even lose by by taking you know, a side to this conflict? Well, we, we, we lose uh, uh, a lot. We, we, we lose uh, a lot of international credibility. You, you take a side that is virtually going beyond, beyond, beyond acceptable limit. So are you going to also condemn another party at another time if that party is bombing civilians, if that party is bombing hospitals, churches, mocks? Are you able to stand and 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 and, and and, and, and take a stand against that. Of course, remember, as a country, we, 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 we are sworn to uphold international law. We are also sworn to ensure a just and equitable world order. 
a just and equitable world order will not come by a country committing uh, this level of atrocity on civilians and we will be mute. We must have our voices heard. We must be, 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 be uh, it must be known that Ghana stands in this, because we have uh, a quite established principle that since independence we have appeared to, we, we were never, uh, we were never scared to, to, to state our position when we feel that the, 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 the order is going on. So uh, if we believe in international law, if we believe in the, the rule of law, uh, the rule of law, if we believe that every, in, in terms of war, civilians should not be targeted, then of course we should have our voices heard. We should not just what, what, what is going on. It is, and of course, as a country, as I said, this war connotation, and therefore as a country, we should be seen doing things in the way that help us to maintain our own harmony at home. Because if you monitor social media posts by a few of our, 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 our Muslim brothers, you will see the, the, the anger in them. And of course, trying to demonstrate their support for Palestine. We are not, not Hamas per se, but the people of Palestine, the civilian population. So of course, and, and, that's also... where, and that's where government appears to disagree. The fact that uh, the, the basis for supporting Israel now is simply before, because of the type of attack uh, we've seen uh, from Hamas on Israel. That type of a attack uh, is also not because uh, uh, Hamas does stood up one day and decided to attack. If you look at the Israeli government, you look at the composition of that government, a government made up of Zionist parties, a government, that coalition government is, is, is built by far-right uh, 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 Israeli uh, uh, political actors. And of course, look at their decision to expand uh, settler uh, homes in, in the West Bank. All these are provocation to, 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 to Hamas and to other groups in that region. If we look at the number of uh, incursions into West Bank and other areas throughout the course of this year, uh, then you understand that uh, at a point, uh, this guy, uh, Hamas and other groups will, will, will retaliate. So we must not only look at it like the, 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 uh, the 7th of October is the trigger. There have been precursors to this conflict. Of course, Israel has acted in a way that has also pushed them to, to kind of attack. Of course, I'm not holding brief from Hamas because they will, all, they will also find a way to, to, to attack Israel. But if you look at from, from, from June, of course, it was clear that at a point, uh, uh, these groups will, 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 will be forced to retaliate for some of the things that, uh, that the Israelis are doing. For instance, where they are expanding on, on settler homes in the West Bank, for instance, where they are evicting uh, 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 Palestinians from their home, it is where they are expanding on, on settler homes in the West Bank, for instance, where they are evicting uh, 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 Palestinians from their home, it is there. Again. And so not increasing it as good for planning, as good for adjusting, and then people can begin to position themselves. I mean, no doubt 30, 31, 32 percent, which is what lending rates are now, is not um, uh, affordable for anyone. Uh, but then I think if you are... To engage in the kind of attack that Hamas has uh, had engaged in on the 7th of, of, of October. And therefore, in responding to this, then it, it begs the question, is it just um, now and they are extending their, 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 their settlement in the West Bank? For anyone, uh, but then I think if you are... To engage in the kind of attack that Hamas has uh, had engaged in on the 7th of, 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 of October. And therefore, in responding to this, then it, it begs the question, is it just um, now and they are extending their, 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 their settlement in the West Bank in, in, in other territories? So when you have this kind of, uh, kind of situation, Ultimately, you provide a context, the pretext for terrorist groups, uh, if you call them that way, or, or, or resistance movement situation. Ultimately, you provide a context, the pretext for terrorist groups, uh, if you call them that way, or, or, or resistance movement. Changing with dynamics, even in this, uh, the, the, the final quarter of the year, um, and, and things related, you may uh, see a different dynamic than my warrant for the high. But at this point, given all factors considered, um, I think that the quarterly adjustment for utility tariffs, uh, at least judging from the quarter one, uh, quarter three numbers, uh, shows that we are near co full cost recovery, and the exchange at the recoveries are almost, um, I mean, e e eroded or if you like, wiped out really. And so you and and, and Hamas, Israel always seems to uh, uh, inflict more damage on the Palestinian population than Hamas would ever. Uh, 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 money to do.
So, um, interesting days ahead. We wait to see what the president uh, would have to say about this. Grateful, uh, Dr. Ishmael Hall, for spending some time uh, with us here on the polls. And uh, more reaction has been greeting you. This. In fact, in Parliament, just as we depicted, MPs calling on the president uh, to redress our posture on the uh, international stage. The reason for which, uh, of course, we've been seeking some answers, but government says its position on this latest Israeli uh, war on Hamas, uh, the stance has not changed. Uh, well, we've been speaking to Kwabinal Sayyid Ankwa, Ghana's ambassador at large, and also a special advisor to the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration. Uh, he's been telling us why uh, government is adopting the stance it is adopting now. Now, going back to Israel and Palestine, right. Ghana's position uh, on that issue has not changed. Um, you know, we've always supported the two-state solution um, based on secure and recognized borders for Israel uh, and the Palestinians. Uh, the recognized uh, leadership of Palestine is the Palestinian Authority. Now, so when we've made statements since 7th October, it is in recognition of the fact that the group that triggered the current uh, situation is Hamas. And Hamas, um, the, 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 I think the, um, the kindest way to describe what they did on 7th October in southern Israel is heinous, um, a, a barbaric uh, attack on civilians, mm -hmm. you know, burning people alive, uh, slitting the throats of uh, individuals, uh, including children, babies. Uh, and I actually uh, saw a video which was played in the General Assembly Hall, I think two days ago, during the emergency special session, where uh, two of the militants were trying to decapitate uh, a guest worker from Thailand. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's just inhuman what happened. And, and so Ghana uh, made an expression of humanity. Uh, you can't see these things and not condemn, uh, uh, condemn them and therefore condemn uh, the actions of Hamas. Um, but we did not just do that. Uh, we did not say that because of that Israel uh, had the right to defend itself. We called on Israel to exercise restraint, and we also uh, called for a resumption of the talks towards the two-state solution. Now, since then, of course, um, Israel has also launched attacks mm -hmm. on Gaza, and Ghana has been in the forefront in the Security Council in, in calling for humanitarian pauses and also now for a humanitarian corridor. But, but that, I'm afraid so that, that call is coming rather late, isn't it? When many say that we missed a number of opportunities at demonstrating to the world that indeed we're interested in the humanitarian crisis. Um, we were speaking to um, Emmanuel Bombandi, the former Deputy Foreign Minister, a couple of days ago, who says that. Uh, positive neutrality posture was at, at its lowest when we failed to support Russia when, when it tabled a resolution asking for a humanitarian ceasefire in the region. Do you take responsibility that I, indeed we, the view we have is, is quite obscured on this matter? I, We're I turning afraid, a blind, blind afraid, eye to what's happening I'm uh, on he, the Gaza Strip. I'm afraid he's wrong. Um, I, I don't think the issue of positive neutrality is what is at stake. Um, uh, what happened in the Security Council was that we were, right at the beginning, we started consultations uh, towards a resolution under the presidency of Brazil. Because Brazil is the president of the Security Council for this month. And Brazil put forward a draft. And there was a consultation around that draft. That's the procedure of the council. Uh, Russia uh, put forward 
its resolution, which was not consulted. Um, anybody who reads the two drafts will recognize that um, uh, the Brazilian draft was more comprehensive. Uh, it responded to the issues at stake uh, better. Uh, and so obviously Ghana supported that. But it, all you need to do is right. to look at the votes. Mm -hmm. um, the Brazilian vote got 12 votes in support, uh, including four of the five countries that supported the Russian draft. So it gives you a sense of what was going on. There were two abstentions. Um, uh, the only challenge was that it, it was vetoed by one permanent member right. of the council. The Ghana abstained because you couldn't have two competing resolutions mm -hmm. and then vote for both of them. It, it, it won't make sense, right? right? Uh, and in fact, Russia at one point had wanted to make amendments, to propose amendments to the Brazilian draft to tell you that uh, they also agreed with uh, almost everything in the, in, the, um, in the Brazilian draft. And they did not veto it. So anyone who thinks that because we chose the better resolution, uh, we're not being positively neutral, mm. it, it's totally mistaken. Well, it was it, a procedural it's, right. uh, uh, issue. Mm. And as I said, even the side that we, we took on the Russian uh, draft resolution, abstention, uh, got the most votes. The countries that abstained were in a majority. All the votes that Ghana has taken on this issue, we've been in the majority. I see, but, but it's not only the experts or the politicians uh, on government on this matter. We also have uh, the coalition of Muslim organizations also expressing worry of the kind of posture of the United Nations Secretariat yeah. here in Accra, yeah. asking them to take a number of uh, measures. And right. as part of that, right. they're going to the Israel uh, right. For, right. For, for what it is doing on the Gaza right. Street. So what, what options are we considering now? Have you taken notice of this petition and what do you intend to, to do about it as a government? Well, again, as I explained, um, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding mm -hmm. around um, uh, the draft resolutions. And Comoc, um, you know, uh, because I think they, they were on your program right. or they were on a program after we explained the process, um, their petition did not mention the Ghana government. There was a petition to the UN Secretary General, which it makes sense. Uh, I think they were calling for uh, a humanitarian response, which we also, the government of Ghana, has been calling for. In fact, the, the resolution that was passed in the General Assembly uh, two days ago uh, which was proposed by the Arab group right. um, under the chairmanship of uh, Jordan, um, was, was intended to respond to the humanitarian situation. Mm -hmm. And Ghana voted for it, even though it was not as balanced as the Brazilian draft resolution, uh, which had come to the Security Council. But the important thing is to, to pay attention to the statement which Ghana made. You know, because there's so many elements to this issue. Right. And um, if you want to create the conditions for the resumption of negotiations towards the two-state uh, uh, solution. solution, you can have groups that are opposed to negotiations uh, Given unfettered freedom to attack the parties to the negotiations. Mm -hmm. So obviously you have to deal with that. But one uh, of the elements so, also yeah. is the religious aspect. And while this war may be remote from you know, our territories, the fear is that there's a possibility of an, you know, uh, a ripple effect spreading through um, you know, the world and also Ghana. The point about how the country may be divided along religious lines, given the war going on in the Middle East. Are you mindful of the possible threats to national security? And what are you doing to de-escalate tension in that, in that 
manner. Blaise, this is also one of the uh, misunderstandings of the situation. Uh, what is happening in Gaza or southern Israel is not religious in the sense that, and I'm, I'm choosing my words right. carefully, in the sense that um, Palestinians um, have a huge number of Christians. You, you know, you can, you can check the whatever. Hamas, um, I assume, proclaims the Islamic Jihad, which is different. So for Ghanaians to look at the situation through the prism of religion will be totally, uh, you know, it's difficult to, to make the argument. Again, as I'm saying, Ghana has taken a balanced and fair approach. And the majority of member states of the UN agree with us. We are mindful of the impact of the current conflict on innocent civilians in Gaza. And our votes, our statements have said that. Um, again, yes, it is true that uh, we worry about a regional conflict, right. you know, bringing in uh, different uh, countries or groups uh, like Hezbollah and the others. But, but don't forget that um, even within the states in which some of those groups are, there is, uh, you know, division of opinion and tension between the, the governments and those armed groups. The, the armed groups are very powerful, but th there is no evidence that the conflict is based on religion. Mm. In which case, uh, then if Ghana were to call for, um, uh, what have we called for? Humanitarian policies so that uh, innocent Palestinians, uh, you know, can uh, be safe and secure, can have access to water, food, uh, medicines, mm. and so on. How does that um, affect okay. the religious sentiments of a Ghanaian? I see. Let's close I, the chapter yeah. on that. Mm. Uh, the issue about repatriation, um, looking at the level of escalation, are, are we considering that as a state? Well, I mean, um, First of all, um, the individuals um, in the theater of conflict, first of all, um, the individuals um, in the theater of conflict um, usually must be ready to be evacuated. I, I believe that's what right. you, you're talking about. Um, uh, as of now, we have not received requests from our citizens uh, to be evacuated. So you think about, but again, as I said, you know there was a, uh, something people said was a fake video of Ghanaians in Gaza. Yes, you know, I've seen that tree. video too. And, and, and a lot so, of, of course, asking, we were very know, much um, uh, concerned. And this also says something about the environment that we live in with uh, disinformation and, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, weaponized um, use of social media platforms. So, so you say these, we were were not, these were not Ghanaians? Is well, that well, what your assessment we is? We went to great you? lengths yeah, okay, right. because, of course, we were concerned mm -hmm. and we wanted to do whatever we could to secure them. Uh, and in that case, uh, the information we got was that it was not genuine. It's a And there's more with uh, Ambassador Seydankwa, who speaks to us later on foreign affairs uh, this weekend. You'd want to uh, catch a full conversation, also bothering on some other matters of international concern. You're watching the polls here on the Joy News Channel. We're taking a break, but we're also looking up ahead to that uh, contest uh, between four individuals who are slugging it out for the presidential primaries of the new patriotic party. There's a warning coming through from the Ashanti Regional Security Council. We'll talk about that, plus tell you what the party has been up to uh, in the early parts of today.
Please stay here on the Journey Channel. This is The Pulse. We'll be right back. Every day, people have money emergencies. Mom, I need my school fees. Emergency. Mom, it's your money emergency. Emergency, emergency. Catch it. I'm your rent. Emergency. Now, there's a new emergency number in town. More money, more money, challenge and enjoyment. At the top life we got. Dial star 770 hash for all your money emergencies. Dial star 770 hash for money emergencies and get easy and quick access to your money, loans, and other banking needs. Echo Bank, the Pan African Bank. Smile, hmm? Look lively, okay? Smile, smile. too small a bad stomach ruins your day don't let it take gastron your most effective antacid for the relief of symptoms of peptic ulcer heartburn gas pain flatulence and indigestion hey guys what are you waiting for let's go let's go Mwah. can you bring down that smile small <laughs> gastron effective relief from stomach discomfort manufactured and distributed by ns chemist limited this advertisement has been written approved by the fda Daddy, Daddy, oh, this tank is big! Yes, that's true. It can store a lot of water. That's so true. Wow, it has a working surface on it. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I can see S I N T E S syntax. That is so true, my daughter. But it falls down into spoilers. That's not true. But why? Yay! Hey. <laughs> Syntex was the first to introduce double layer tanks in Ghana. Syntex again was the first to introduce white inner layers in Ghana. Syntex gives yes, no matter your water needs, Syntex is the answer. Syntex tank. Are you strong? Are you tough? Prepare for an exhilarating experience at the main fair of the 2023 EcoBank Journey. Now, there's a new emergency number in town. More money, more money, and enjoyment. At the top life we got. Dial star 770 hash for all your money emergencies in top life. Dial star 770 hash for money emergencies and get easy and quick access to your money, loans, and other banking needs. EcoBank, the Pan African Bank. Smile, hmm? Look lively, okay? Smile, smile! Is the money too small? A bad stomach ruins your day. Don't let it. Take Gastron, your most effective antacid for the relief of symptoms of peptic ulcer, heartburn, gas pain, flatulence, and indigestion. Hey guys, what are you waiting for? Let's go, let's go. Mwah. Can you bring down that smile small? <laughs> Gastron, effective relief from stomach discomfort. Manufactured and distributed by NS Chemist Limited. This advertisement has been written approved by the FDA. Daddy? Daddy, oh, this tank is big! Yes, that's true. It can store a lot of water. That's so true. Wow, it has a working surface on it. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I can see S-I-N-T-E-S syntax. That is so true, my daughter. But it falls down into spoilers. That's not true. But why? Why? <laughs> Syntex was the first to introduce double layer tanks in Ghana. Syntex again was the first to introduce white inner layers in Ghana. 
Sintex gives yes. No matter your water needs, Sintex is the answer. Sintex tank. Are you strong? Are you tough? Prepare for an exhilarating experience at the main fair of the 2023 Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair. Join us at the Accra International Conference Center from Thursday, November 23rd to Sunday, November 26th, 2023. Doors will be open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day from Thursday, November 23rd to Sunday, November 26th, 2023. Doors will be open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day. Whether you're embarking on your home ownership journey or looking for upgrades, this fair is your destination for all things housing. Encounter a comprehensive assembly of stakeholders from Ghana Tank, Air Strong, Air Tough, Springfield Estates, where dreams are built, virtual security, complete security solution, DBS, your roof experts, virtual infosec Africa, security solutions by design, St. Gobain, making the world a better plan, Clifton Homes, Beautiful homes, wise investments. The Kissington Heights, Airport City, Kumasi, by HDG Homes Limited. This is your election headquarters uh, build up to the NDC, NPP's uh, presidential primaries as the Ashanti Regional Security Council is now warning against uh, the deployment of heavily bid and any other primary uh, of the NPP. Personal security of various government officials are also banned from accessing the inner perimeter of the polling stations. In a press release, the Regional Security Council insists security of the polls will solely be the responsibility uh, of state security. Uh, of course, uh, earlier in the day, uh, the National Leadership and the Elections Committee of the New Patriotic Party has been briefing the press. We'll take you to the Ashanti region shortly. But first, though, uh, let's bring in my colleague Samuel Mbura, who's been at the party's headquarters monitoring the developments for us. Uh, and Sammy, uh, we do know that the party has also been uh, spelling out some more modalities for the contest, including the decision by all aspirants to sign a peace accord before the exercise. Tell us more. Exactly, Blazet. So the three organs of the LPP met, we had the National Executive Council, the National Council, and the Council of Elders. The main reason for this meeting was to calm the less of the aspirants going into the Congress this weekend. So all four aspirants were in attendance. The president himself was also there. They gave the opportunity to the aspirants to raise their concerns. And then they also um, tried sorting the issues out so that at least going into the election, they will not have grievances that are outstanding. So um, the chairman of the I mean, the MPP, Elders of uh, Council of Elders, Mr. Hakman or Usla Jiman, uh, told these aspirants that they should consider the party's interest beyond GS and rally behind anyone who would eventually um, emerge victorious. So that was an in camera hearing, but after that meeting, the media was briefed by the General Secretary, Justin Simponkodia. He announced the modalities involved. One that has to do with, uh, one that is actually crystal, has to do with one. Um, undertaking that these aspirants have signed to. The, the undertaking demands that if you, in the unlikely event, you lose the election, whether Baumia, whether Kennedy in Japan, Adaylimo, or Dr. Fia Koto, you will not depart from the party um, and then resign or vote independence, just as seen in the case of Alan Chiamante. So this is um, issue stemmed out from the actions or the previous action by Alan Chiamante after the superdelegates conference. So this, the question about whether this particular directive or undertaking is just a moral one or a legal one, the party clarifies that uh, it, is, it is a moral one that guides any right-thinking member of the, the party. So um, the situation, how the situation evolves, if there's an unfortunate situation of that nature, they'll decide how to go about it. I wanted to listen to the general secretary, 
just a simple about some of these modalities among others. And, and just before we hear from him, uh, how about you know the National Elections Committee, uh, the, the concerns, final rounds of concerns being raised by some of the aspirants? How are they taking that and respond, responding to uh, all of the concerns being raised now? Well, it appears it has been a football and a mutual meeting with the aspirants because I engaged some of the aspirants. They said, yes, all that has been discussed um, at the meeting um, were mutual. So they don't have any reservations to that. Right. And they, they, they will not hold the committee to brief. Uh, so they have agreed. They don't have grievances. They are only waiting to see how the conduct of the elections would go. For now, they are assured that the election committee will do a good job, but we don't know what will happen a day before or during the day of the election. Uh, let's talk about the way forward now. Uh, what's the resolution of the leadership uh, of, of the party post the presidential primaries uh, in terms of party unity and, and how the party intends to solidify its base going into the 2024 elections? Brother, that has been a major concern here. The former president, John Ejekunku, was part of this meeting. He joined via Zoom. So this should tell you how critical this meeting was, having all the big wigs in the MPP coming to be part of this election. So the concentration had to do more of the post-electoral risk or factions that will be created. At least the party is convinced that after the Alan breakout, where they have been able to patch the risk. So they are expecting that after this election, the um, aspirants would come together and rally behind the one that will win the election so that they will go into the 2024 general election without any factionalism or any cracks to face the NDC. So that issue has been talked about. They've gotten assurance from the aspirants, but there's still some uncertainty mm. because there may be issues or there are still issues that some of the aspirants would want to see the election committee act on. Although they have, for the meantime, actually agreed with them the guidelines that have been stipulated. Okay. However, the conduct of the election will determine whether these aspirants are mm. satisfied with Indeed. what they have agreed uh, with the uh, critical of the party. Yeah, team. and such a heated um, that weekend that's going to be, but you need to stay here on the election headquarters. John East is bringing you uh, a 360-degree coverage of that uh, presidential primary. Samuel Mbura joining us from the NPP headquarters. Uh, we'll bring you, John East is bringing you uh, a 360-degree coverage of that uh, presidential primary. Samuel Mbura joining us from the NPP headquarters. Uh, we'll bring you... Okay, so like Riley said, there is the beat of making sure that we are able to produce to feed ourselves first and foremost um, so the bulk of our focus is to ensure that Ghanaian farmers are able to produce quality affordable nutritious food to feed Ghana then there is also the issue of the high imports of food take for instance we're able to produce only about 40, barely 50 percent of our rice um, rice requirements which brings a high import demand on the country. So we are very focused at making sure that we increase production productivity. Indicating that they would not allow um, vigilante groups or uh, private militia to be there, um, you know, to, to guide the process. Let's bring in Anaya Aljima, who's been monitoring the exercise there uh, in that part. Looking at the mood in the Ashanti region, because uh, mind you, this is the base of the governing new patriotic party. Um, the contest must be tough in that region for all the aspirants, isn't it? Very tough in the Ashanti region. And uh, mind you, um, two of the four or aspirants in this race are from the Ashanti region. That's Dr. Um, Ose Epi Akutu. He was once the member of parliament for the Kwadaso constituency. And he is touting um, his achievements as MP and achievements as um, a Greek minister in the Ashanti region, and he believes that um, because of what he has been able to do for the Ashanti region, have to reward him with their votes come mm. Saturday. I also, um, the former member of parliament for Mampong constituency, Mr. Adenimo, is also in the race. He's known to the people of the Ashanti region, and he's also pointing to the Ashanti region as his stronghold. Uh, mind you, um, the, 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 the vice president, won the super delegate conference in the Ashanti region. He had over 90 votes out of the 119 votes 
meaning he's so, so strong on the grounds when it comes to the Ashanti region. A uh, Canadian Japan has also done a lot of work in the Ashanti region, and he's expecting the people of the Ashanti region to vote towards, towards his direction. So um, Ashanti region remains one of the areas that all the four candidates are um, you know, strongly pointing to, and they, are, they believe that they'll be able to win most of the votes from the region. Let's talk uh, finally about, you know, the enforcement. They, are, they believe that they'll be able to win most of the votes from the region. Let's talk uh, finally about, you know, the enforcement. Now, productivity is not going as high because there is still gaps in... Force this directive strictly, uh, knowing that the stakes are high, as we were just pointing out, uh, for each and every candidate. So before we talk about how they are ensuring that the the, the out within the perimeter or anywhere around the area, items that have pictures or any um, you know signage of any of the four candidates are also not allowed in the area, and also mobile phones are not allowed in the inner perimeter. This is to prevent people from taking pictures of their ballots. So um, the Ashanti Region um, Security Council has teamed out up with the police already to make sure that the um, directives are well taking some um, clue from what happened in the NDC um, election um, earlier this year. Um, the police, there will be a lot of policemen on the ground and there will be include policemen as well to ensure that the, 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 the rules or the directives that are issued are well adhered to. Anaya Jima joining us uh, there from the Ashanti Regional Capital, Kumasi, where uh, a lot is at stake for all the four candidates going into the uh, weekend's presidential primaries of the governing New Patriotic Party. This is your election headquarters. We're bringing you uh, every bit of the updates that you uh, need to know about the exercise going into the weekend because uh, in the diaspora, election is also underway. Uh, but here in Ghana, of course, the national leadership of the NPP has been addressing its uh, rank and file ahead of that exercise. The, our party's National Council of Elders. At the meeting, we had the President of our Republic, His Excellency Nana Dankwe Kufuado. We also had the former President, John Ajekun Kufo, joining us by Zoom. We had members of the Council, National Council of Elders led by the Chairman of the National Council of Elders. The National Party members of the Council, National Council of Elders led by the Chairman of the National Council of Elders. The National Party... We, we know that over the past six years before the halt of the first phase, a lot was invested into that program. What is your general assessment of the program? Well, um, I wouldn't be able to give my assessment of the program. Um, what we do as AGRA is to provide support for government to make sure that policies are well crafted, well delivered. And so part of that well delivered strategy for policies means that we could help in carrying out assessments. Uh, we have been supporting institutions that are assessing the planting for food and jobs. Um, also had members of the presidential elections committee led by our revered right honorable uh, former speaker is that we're able to get the four aspirants contesting namely honorable Kennedy Japo, his excellency dr Lahaj muhammad muhammad baumia dr akutofi and honorable adenimo all signing and an undertaking. And in summary, what they signed to, and I'll read to all of you, one is to accept the primary election results, two, to promote peace and cohesion, three, in the event that they don't win, they will not resign from the party, Four, to support the winner of the primary. Five, to ensure and enforce mechanism that has been established by the party and also to work within the timelines and duration that has been established that 
has been established by the party and also to work within the timelines and duration that has been established. You, you probably would know that the documents are not out there yet yes. in the public. Uh, and so even though there has been some level of consultation, we do not have the full picture yet. We do know that there is a focus on input credits rather than input subsidy, which is good. We would want to see how it is structured. We would want to be sure that it does not give an overexposure to any single player in the value chain. Because if that happens, when that chain, that portion of the chain... The decision by the delegates of our part, and these are the signatures of the aspirants who came for the meeting. College. Under Article 1311, our constitution states, the party's presidential candidates shall be elected by the following delegates. One, all members of the National Council. Two, all voting members of the National Executive Committee. Three, all voting members of the Regional Executive Committees. Four, all voting members of the Constituency Executive Committees. Five, all electoral area coordinators. Six, the five polling station executive officers in each polling station. Seven, 15 members of the National Council of Elders to be elected from amongst themselves. <clears throat> we also have 15 patrons to be elected from among themselves, all party members of parliament, past national officers, three representatives of each of the special organs of the party, 12 delegates from every external branch, funding members who are signatories to the registration documents of the party at the electoral commission, one TESCOM representative from each recognized tertiary institution, all, part, all party card-bearing ministers and deputies, and last not least, all MMDCs. So ladies and gentlemen, these are the group that form the electoral college that will, be, that will elect our presidential candidate come November 4th. So in total, we have 200. That's addressed uh, by uh, the General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, Justin Kodia Fripon. Now, uh, the chiefs and people of uh, Janga in the West Mamprosi municipality of the Northeast region have threatened to boycott all political activities ahead of the 2024 general elections if government fails to complete the uh, Nasia Janga road that connects the town to the municipal capital. The paramount chief of the uh, area uh, and his elders are therefore calling on the president to redeem the promise he made uh, to them during the sword cutting ceremony for the commencement of uh, work on the 25.7 kilometer road project. 25.7 Janga Nasia Road project in the West Mamprosi municipality was ongoing until the change of government in 2016. The project was swiftly abrogated and reawarded by the Akufuadu administration. In 2018, the president himself came to cut sword for the recommencement of work by the new contractor. At the Deba in Nasia, attended by the chiefs and people of the area, President Akufuadu promised them the road project will be completed before the 2020 elections. So, how long are they going to take? Um, 24 months. From now? From now. From now. So by 2020, around this time, the work should be completed. Six years down the lane, the contractor has abandoned the project due to non-payment. Surprisingly, however, the contractor was made to tie a six-kilometer stretch of the road from Nasia to Nakwayili village and another one kilometer to the Janga town, leaving out a large stretch of 18.7 kilometers of the road in a very deplorable state. The residents say they see it as an attempt to conceal the failure to fix the road. Some commercial drivers express the challenges they face doing business on the road. Yeah, we are facing a lot of suffering on the road. 
a move rains have created a large potholes which are causing our vehicles to break down and hinder the movement of goods and services. We are worried because the contractor has abandoned the project. The project upon completion would have opened up and improved access to essential public services and increased livelihood opportunities in several communities in the Janga Zone. Residents of communities along the road have complained that the poor state of the road is affecting their socioeconomic activities. Residents of communities along the road have complained that the poor state of the road is affecting their socioeconomic activities. Needed in, 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 in what geometric proportions because of the cost of getting the food to the market centers. The roads are bad, the infrastructure is not there, we don't have um, um, basic infrastructure to food across. Processing, storage, transportation, these things are not adequately in place. One of the highest contributors of food price in Ghana is cost of transportation. And part of it is because the roads are just so bad. And so Plus, a meeting in Adelbo. Before you get to Nasia, you spend about so many hours on the road. You can go. Our market... The free flow of uh, the uh, waters, flood waters as a result of the spillage of the dam into the sea, mitigating the devastation of the flooding in three municipalities of Ketang Loga and Ketu South. Uh, uh, checks by Joy News reveals that uh, the process, which began a week ago, has, success, has been successful in making it uh, possible for flood waters in three municipalities and even in three uh, of the North uh, Tong. Uh, areas uh, to recede considerably. Ivy Setoji and her team re- returned to the area and found this report. Since the opening of the floodgate uh, here in Azizaji to enable uh, the water or the lagoon to flow easily uh, to the sea, with this opening of the floodgates, it's also uh, making it easy for the waters in the three town districts and some other districts uh, that experience the flooding due to the coastal uh, dam spillage uh, to recede. So water, water in... Twelve delegates from every external branch, Funding members who are signatories to the registration documents of the party at the Electoral Commission. One Tesco representative from each recognized tertiary institution. All, part, all party card-bearing ministers and deputies. And last not least, all MMDCs. So ladies and gentlemen, these are the group that form the electoral college that will be that we let our presidential candidate come November 4th. So in total, we have 200. That's addressed uh, by uh, the general secretary of the new patriotic party, Justin Kodia Fripon. Now, uh, the chiefs and people of uh, Janga in the West Mamprosi municipality of the northeast region have threatened to boycott all political activities ahead of the 2024 general elections if government fails to complete the uh, Nasia Janga road that connects the town to the municipal capital. The paramount chief of the uh, area uh, and his elders are therefore calling on the president to redeem the promise he made uh, to them during the sword cutting ceremony for the commencement of uh, work on the 25.7 kilometer road project. 25.7 Janga Nasia Road project in the West Mamprosi municipality was ongoing until the change of government in 2016. The project was swiftly abrogated and reawarded by the Akufuadu administration. In 2018, the president himself came to cut sword for the recommencement of work by the new contractor. At a deba in Nasia attended by the chiefs and people of the area, President Akufuadu promised them the road project will be completed before the 2020 elections. So how long are they going to take? Um, 24 months. From now? From now. From now. So by 2020, around this time, the work should be completed. Six years down the lane, the contractor has abandoned the project due to non-payment. Surprisingly, however, the contractor was made to tie a six-kilometer stretch of the road from Nasia to Nakwayili village and another one kilometer to the Janga town, leaving out a large stretch of 18.7 kilometer of the road in a very deplorable state. The residents say they see 
see it as an attempt to conceal the failure to fix the road. Some commercial drivers express the challenges they face doing business on the road. We are facing a lot of suffering on the road. The rains have created a large potholes which are causing our vehicles to break down and hinder the movement of goods and services. We are worried because the contractor has abandoned the project. The project upon completion would have opened up and improved access to essential public services and increased livelihood opportunities in several communities in the Janga zone. Residents of communities along the road have complained that the poor state of the road is affecting their socioeconomic activities while the Janga zone. Residents of communities along the road have complained that the poor state of the road is affecting their socioeconomic activities. What is meted in, 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 in what geometric proportions because of the cost of getting the food to the market centers. The roads are bad, the infrastructure is not there, we don't have um, um, basic infrastructure to take food across. Processing, storage, transportation, these things are not adequately in place. One of the highest contributors of food price in Ghana is cost of transportation. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because the roads are just so bad. Mm -hmm. And so a meeting in Before you get to Nasia, you spend about so many hours on the road. You can go. Yeah. Our market. The free flow of uh, the uh, waters, flood waters as a result of the spillage of the dam into the sea, mitigating the devastation of the flooding in three municipalities of Ketang Loga and Ketu South. Uh, uh, checks by Joy News reveals that uh, the process, which began a week ago, has, success, has been successful in making it uh, possible for flood waters in three municipalities and even in three uh, of the North uh, Tong. Uh, areas uh, to recede considerably. Ivy Setoji and her team re returned to the area and found this report. Since the opening of the floodgate uh, here in Azizaji to enable uh, the water or the lagoon to flow easily uh, to the sea, with this opening of the floodgates, it's also uh, making it easy for the waters in the three town districts and some other districts uh, that experience the flooding due to the coastal road uh, dam spillage uh, to recede. So water, waters in those areas are receding as we speak uh, due to uh, dam spillage uh, to recede. So water, waters in those areas are receding as we speak. Uh, we have set sight that by the time we finish delivering our current strategy, at least 1.2 million farmers would have graduated from um, subsistence farming to more market-oriented, diversified farming systems. That will go some way to support what we are doing with everything else that is happening. Hmm. Do you think there's a future for Ghana's agriculture sector? Absolutely. Issue. Uh, some went on demonstration. Uh, some agitated that they were not so happy about it because of the past experience. Some said it something years ago where to the sea, and um, I'm a happy man. I to speak now. So residents are hoping that what happened not be repeated or will not happen here. I'm very much impressed. So I have to thank our DC for. Uh, forcing the community to allow this gate to be open. We are here this afternoon to erect caution tape here to prevent our members from going near uh, the scene. Because when we are here in the morning, we have observed that the samba is curving in. So as people are going to the edge of the samba, they can fall into, the, into it at any given time and it will be a problem for the assembly and for our community. We are watching Kenny. I will give you into, the, into it at any given time and it will be a problem for the assembly and for our community. We are watching Kenny. I will give you have been delivered adequately. If we do that, we hold the other parts of the value chains. We look at agriculture in the view of the food food system, we would be able to make progress. Mm. Thank you very much, Juliet. My name is Ivy Setovi for joining us. District Chief Executive Officer of the Nocturne District Divine 
uh, Fenno says uh, that data collection on the to be corrected immediately for people to move back to their houses. And then also we are also taking data on houses that have been destroyed, people who have uh, uh, their crops destroyed and all those. So um, we have begin we have begun collecting the data uh, with the physical planning department and the works department uh, through the assembly members and the uh, 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 traditional authority, so that we can identify those people uh, as quickly as possible. We also want to ensure that people don't abuse the system. Uh, people may not lose anything, but they may want to ride there. So uh, we will have a way of visiting most of the communities ourselves to ensure that the, right, the correct data is provided uh, for government to deal with the issues. Well, the MC adds that plans are underway to relocate flood victims from school structures to pay for it for academic exercise to commence in schools that are serving as safe havens uh, for flood victims in the district. We are making arrangements for uh, the people to move from those places so that our students can, can go back to the classroom. That is also an issue we'll be discussing today. Uh, because when the education minister came, uh, they assured us of helping us. Uh, we, the, the first care group ambassador, the construction ambassadors, have also started working on some camps for us. I believe that by the close of next week, uh, that camp will also be ready. Then we can move a, a, a number of uh, people, affected people, who are living in the classrooms to stay, to move in there. So the classrooms will be available for learning. Uh, we've, we, we, some other group are coming to uh, fill some uh, tents, about 250 tents for one particular school, so that the people can move away from, from the classrooms. And then uh, I'm sure those people will come today. And so there are, uh, when we meet today, other issues that will come up, other uh, 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 suggestions that will come up, we will use them. Uh, and, and then help the process. So it, it's, a, it's a bigger issue uh, because tomorrow, understand that the senior high school uh, schools will also be open. And uh, you know, St. Kizito is hosting well over 1,003 uh, uh, affected people. And so we need to move the people from there to allow the students to also go back. So we'll, we'll take up that issue today also to see how best we can address it before uh, tomorrow. An executive secretary of the Public Utility Regulatory Commission, uh, Dr. Ishmael Aka, says his outfit is working closely uh, with utility companies to improve their performance in order to satisfy their customers. Speaking in Wa after an engagement with the students of uh, Nasarat uh, Ahmadiyya College of Education, he indicated that the uh, Ghana Utility Performance Index, which was uh, introduced by PRC, has brought out the best in companies. I suppose. Regional correspondent Rafiq Salam now reports. The past few months, the Public Regulatory Commission, PURC, has been engaging stakeholders on the need to conserve energy and also for them to know their rights, where they educate them on the tariff process, understand the efficiency mechanisms, and be ambassadors at their various homes to educate the people around them on the work of the PURC. Executive Secretary of the PURC, Dr. Ismail Aka, in an interview with the media after an engagement with students of the Nasrajan Amade College of Education, noted that the engagement will also give students the opportunity to ask questions and recommendations in order for them to have an efficient water and electricity sector. Yes, we believe that uh, students, some students are uh, in the rented accommodation, they pay their own electricity bills. Some of them are in dormitories where the bills are charged on them as part of their fees. So they are very important stakeholder. Again, we are also, these are College of Education students. We see that very soon they are going into the world to be teachers. So if we educate them, chances are that they can also educate others and spread the world. So this is why PURC is focusing on educating students this year. However, we are also working with workers, with market women and other groups so that together we all understand what we do as a regulator. And even if you have a complaint, the processes you can go through to reach us. Dr. Ismail Aka expressed satisfaction over the engagement held so far with the tested institutions, praising the students 
for the questions posed. So uh, the good thing is that they are asking very intelligent questions, one on the, how the tariff is even approved, uh, whether it would ever come down or to go up, and uh, some of these efficiency mechanisms. Some of the concerns also border on quality of service, that why should I pay, but uh, maybe if the light is going off, they don't tell me, and so many other things. So it also gives us that platform to educate them that, yeah, for instance, the utilities, if for any reason you cannot serve a customer, you have to let the customer know. So we give them some of these things. If you don't let the customer know, first of all, talk to the utility. If you don't get satisfactory answer, come to PURC. So it's more like an education platform where they are giving us a lot of questions and recommendations, especially issues bordering quality of services. Ask whether he is satisfied with the performance of the companies that they are the regulatory powers are under this was his response. PURC over the past year have been publishing what we call the Ghana Utility Performance Index. Now what we are doing is that we are not even looking at the utility as one. We are looking at the regional performance. So when you take Ghana water, what of all the 13 regions of Ghana water company in Ghana, Ghana water were 2021, they were fourth. But fourth, in customer service and others, they have their rank. In operational efficiency, they have their rank. What we are doing is that we are ranking the various regions so that we work with them to improve. When it comes to NEDCO, they also have their rank. So we are doing more like regional monitoring and see some areas they are doing well, some areas they need to improve so that they can serve customers better. Principal of National Jana Madia College of Education, Abdul Mumin Abdulaziz, was happy with the engagement stating that it will go a long way to help the college and the students. Just currently, the government has ceded the payment of uh, electricity to us, and then we are struggling to pay. So with this education, I know that it's going to help our students, it's going to help the school, because um, taking them through how they can consume electricity is going to help the school to manage the electricity very, very well. And that's where I get enthused about it. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam. Wow. And now the resilience uh, of Lake Busunchi in the biggest, it's actually uh, the biggest uh, lake in West Africa. Is that really? And now the resilience uh, of Lake Busunchi in the biggest, it's actually uh, the biggest uh, lake in West Africa. Is that really? The neem oil is ready now. So I'm going to sieve it. So for this solution, I used chili pepper and my liquid soap, which is Alata Semina. In fact, when you use Alata Semina or any liquid soap in this solution, what it does is that it breaks down the nervous system of those insects. It distorts their breathing pattern, thereby they will be unable to feed very well. And then I also use my neem oil extract. So I use one tablespoonful of the neem oil, and then I use one tablespoonful of the liquid soap, my Alata Semina. And then I use two tablespoonful of my pepper. You can either use the fresh cayenne pepper or the powdered one. And please, if you are using the powdered one, make sure you sieve it because it contains particles and you don't want those particles to block your spray can. So you mix everything together, you get your solution and like I always say, test it on one plant and see if it will react well. If it doesn't cause any harm to the leaves, then you can go ahead and spray in your garden. Based on a 1986 baseline study, their research discovered a sharp decline in water levels, a reduction in size of the lake, and a decline in fish population. To be the landing area for bulls plowing on the lake bosom chain. But with time, the water has receded, leaving this natural land in between the landing area and the lake. Sediments, including organic matter and silt, associated with human activities and erosion, are said to have built up underneath the biggest natural lake. Malta and silt, associated with human activities and erosion, are said to have built up underneath the biggest natural lake. I was away for a while, but now I'm back and I'm thrilled to be your host today. Coming up on the show... 
In our street debate, Edith Kimani asks young people about the state of women's rights in Rwanda. We meet Barbara Nasserian, one of the first female tour guides in Kenya's famous Masai Mara National Reserve. And we take off with Uganda's youngest pilot, Graham Shema. <laughs> This week, I read a pretty shocking statistic. Less than 1% of women and girls globally live in a country with high women empowerment and high gender equality. Less than 1%. That's according to the UN Development Program. Well, one country where women at least appear to have advanced in terms of getting equal rights as men and holding high leadership positions is Rwanda. But what does that achievement mean, especially given that most power still lies within the hands of one man, President Paul Kagame? Edith Kimani went searching for answers in this week's street debate. Hello and welcome back to the 77%. This week we are in Kigali, Rwanda, also known as the land of a thousand hills. More recently, it's come to be known as the best place for women in politics. And that's because over 60% of parliamentarians here are women. That's compared to just over 20% globally. So you can see what the big deal is. Their natural resources in partnership with their overseas counterparts from three institutions are seeking to build the lake's resilience. We don't know the current and the future consequences of this. This time, we are stepping up with Syntex Tank. Step up with Syntex Tank. We'll see contestants answer questions of their choice and win over 6,000 Ghana CDs cash prize weekly and other products from our sponsors. This season, viewers at home should watch out for the Syntex Tank question of the week. Be the first to answer correctly via WhatsApp or send SMS to 050-833-8888 and win incredible prizes. The person who answers most of the weekly questions correctly and fastest gets a 65-inch Samsung TV at the end incredible prizes. The person who answers most of the weekly questions correctly and fastest gets a 65-inch Samsung TV at the end or consent by your husband to get a job or to open a bank account. Sponsored by Bell Eyes, MTN Momo, Angel Cola, powered by Syntax Tan. Joy Prime, your ultimate experience. Just for you. See you there. The Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair is in partnership with Ecobank, the Pan-African Bank, and powered by the Plan City Extension Project from Citizen Habitats, Rent to Own, and sponsored by Elegant Homes and General Constructions Limited, where quality meets value. Global Lighting, your solution to quality lighting. Syntex Tank, Air Strong, Air Tough, Springfield Estates, where dreams are built. Virtual Security, Complete Security Solution, DBS, Your Roof Experts, Virtual Infosec Africa, Security Solutions by Design, St. Gobain, Making the World a Better Plan, Clifton Homes, Beautiful Homes, Wise Investments, The Kissington Heights, Airport City, Kumasi, by HDG Homes Limited.
welcome to Let's Talk Showbiz here on the Joy News Channel. My name is Doreen Avio, and today we have some good news for us. And it has to do with a concert, or should I say a program, that was held at the Switzerland Embassy. Obviously, encouraging us all to keep pushing our music globally. I'll bring you excerpts of that as well. And Thames is in the news. Thames was the one who actually, I mean, composed the song for Black Panther. And she's not really into the song that much. And you remember her dress she wore for the Grammys. <laughs> well, she's been talking about that as well. These and many more here on the show do not go anywhere. If you're just joining me, this is Let's Talk Showbiz, and we're starting with the event that was held at the Switzerland Embassy last night. So my colleague Nicholas was there, Nicholas Yamua, and he actually had the opportunity to speak to the ambassador. That's the Switzerland ambassador. But most importantly, people were treated to some good music, you know, food here and there. But in that conversation with the Switzerland ambassador, obviously, we're all encouraging everybody to help push the Ghana music agenda globally, but now she reiterated that in the interview with Nicolas. Let's hear from her and everything that happened at the embassy last night. with me the Swiss ambassador to Ghana that's uh, Her Excellency Simon Giga thank you so much for joining us perfect pronunciation by the way <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us more um, um, about why you decided to have this concert Africa vibes um, you know um, it was actually a great opportunity because um, the EMU that's the, the music school from from Lausanne they are having this program for their students and we learned about this uh, and it's all about you know exchange between Switzerland and Ghana and as you know chess is like um, a coming together and merging on different music styles so we we heard about this exchange program we said like oh we as embassy of course have to be part of this because we are all about strengthening swiss Ghanaian relations so for us it was a great opportunity and i think people appreciate it a lot today you know so do you think that um, the ghana creative sector is doing enough to project its talent um that's a very good question. I mean, you know, like there is so much creativity in Ghana, right? Um, that is actually one of the things that impressed me the most when I came here. Like, it's a relatively small country, right? But there is so much creativity. And wherever you look, you look in the music industry, you look in the visual arts, including photography, um, you look into poetry, uh, literature, everywhere you look, there's creativity, even handicrafts, right? So um, are you doing enough to project that to the outside world? Um, good question. I, I think, you know, if you don't come to Ghana, it's quite hard to know about all that. So maybe in terms of like promotion to the outside world, beyond Ghana, I think they, they, you could do more but um, I also don't have, you know, now the solution on how to do that. Should we expect any collaboration in future with our creative arts sector? Um, that's certainly something um, we want to promote further, always with the angle of the exchange between Switzerland and Ghana, right? So all like also the blending of African and European 
elements. Um, so certainly we want to pursue that further. Now we are also a small embassy unfortunately with the limited financial means but we, we really try to leverage all the cultural talent that is out there and then with our generous sponsors, friends, you know, I think we will ha have the opportunity to make a few such e events happening. Before we go, do you have any last words for uh, Swiss people in Ghana? For Swiss people in Ghana, um, you know, um, thank you very much for those who attended tonight. Um, as I said, we will be planning more such events. Um, please, uh, please come, please support us, please um, spread the words. And also, when you go back to Switzerland, promote Ghanaian culture. Thank you. Um, within the framework of the Swiss Embassy, um, as I said, you know, we are, we're trying actually to promote um, different strands of activities and the way how we see our role, it's we bring people together, right? Like tonight, the, the occasion was music and jazz. And we do similar um, things when it comes to, like, for instance, the field of recycling and upcycling and waste management. Or we try to bring people together, like we, we, we do women networking events. So um, we are trying really to create um, a platform where people can meet and exchange. Um, and there will be a lot of opportunities where we invite people and bring them together. In terms of, like... Longer term funding, I'm, I'm afraid um, there are other embassies, you know, who are better positioned than us, unfortunately. Right, so that was what you missed last night. But obviously, once Nicholas was there, he's brought us all this update. Let's keep pushing Ghana music out there. Let's be intentional about it. She's also said it. What are you doing about it? Ghana music to the world. Away from that, we're moving straight to Tidal.